amazing Holy God, you made us in your image, and we belong to you alone. Therefore, we offer ourselves to you in service and in love and in praise. To use us for the glory of your realm and the good of your people, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And all of God's people say,
showed me the coin used to pay the tax, and they brought him a denarius. Whose image and inscription is this? Jesus asked. Caesar, they replied. Then he said, Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and give to God what belongs to God. When they heard this, they were astonished and departed. This is the word of God for the people. And I was praying through this, I kept thinking to myself, this is a weird text for us on Lady Sunday, where we celebrate the gifts and graces of all people who walk into our doors and how they continue to further the ministry of God. But then I began to realize that this text is deeper than what we think. Our, our text for this morning, for example, is the first of three debates between Jesus and the religious leaders with their many different doctrinal positions. And these debates begin to paint a picture of Jesus as a threat to the religious and political authorities of Jesus' day. One might say that this debate is the beginning of the end these debates are that which lead Jesus to the cross as Jesus fails to take any sort of political or religious side regarding these various interpretations of both civic law and the laws found in the Torah. In fact, for being in our passage this morning, we begin to see both sides of the debate conclude and collude together in trying to entrap Jesus in his own words. The Pharisees who supported freedom from Roman oppression and the Herodians who supported Rome and Roman taxation worked together and given where their differences lie, their hypothetical loyalty lie, whereby one group pledges loyalty to the law of God and the other group pledges their allegiance to Caesar, we would expect that these two groups would be at each other's throats. But in the text, in the text, they are united in their opposition. Have you ever seen this happen in real life? When two groups who would disagree come together in opposition? I certainly have. Amen? Amen. If Jesus said it is right to pay taxes to Caesar, then he would have affirmed the Roman occupation and Caesar's ownership or loathship over the promised land, and if he had said not to pay taxes to Caesar, then that would have been illegal. And telling others not to pay their taxes was grounds for an arrest. So if Jesus said, we'll just see his lordship and don't give or don't pay your taxes, he would have most definitely been reported to the Roman authorities, and he would have been arrested. Yes. If he affirmed the Roman occupation, he would have essentially declared that Caesar is God. Here, the religious leaders try to trap Jesus as they hope that he will pick one side over the other. And Jesus knows that the tax is implemented by the Romans, and it can only be paid by Roman coin. Most of these coins contain an image and an inscription considered to be blasphemous by many of the Jews. It said, Tiberius Caesar, August, son of divine Augustus High Priest. Interestingly, Jesus does not have the legal tender which is required to pay to Rome. He doesn't have it in his pocket or on his person, and therefore he asked them to show him the coin that is used to pay the taxes. And it is the Pharisees, the religious leader, not the head Aryan, who produced this coin from their pocket, this coin used to pay Roman taxes with its heretical inscription and image that belonged to Caesar. 
And in producing this coin from their pockets, the leaders of the temple have fallen into their own trap for having such a coin within the temple walls itself. It's against the laws of the Torah. It's against the Jewish law. It's against the first commandment. What is it? Thou shalt have no what? Shall have no God above you. And so they break the law of the Torah. It is in the 15th, the moment that Jesus said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and in doing so, Jesus affirms some duty to the emperor or the government, and thus Jesus affirms the legitimacy of the government itself, and being a servant of God does not exempt me or you from paying your taxes and being tax-paying servants of the state. We are not exempt from jury duty, car inspections, or paying taxes, or all the other lovely things our government has us do. Amen? Yet, in the very same sentence, Jesus affirms that not everything belongs to the emperor, not everything belongs to the government, regardless of what the emperor or the government might want to think. In essence, Jesus says, give to the government what belongs to the government, nothing less and nothing more. In our nation, where although we have the separation between church and state, and yet we still tend to merge national loyalty or party loyalty with the Christian faith together, the gospel lesson speaks something to us. For Jesus makes it clear that national loyalty and the Christian faith don't always mix. Give what belongs to Caesar and nothing more. There is a higher authority than Caesar, and we as Christians have to answer to that higher authority. The coin bearing the image of Caesar holds no value in the kingdom of heaven. Furthermore, rendering on to Caesar what belongs to Caesar does not mean that the emperor, the president, governor, or any other elected official is doing the will of God. Rather, the New Testament, that the prophets and Christ himself are often concerned with the ways that the government treats its own people. The coin given to Jesus, which bears the image of Caesar on it, which indicates that the coin belongs to Caesar. And Jesus said this coin is in, made in the image of Caesar, therefore he says give it to Caesar. Yet this small statement is profound, for it leads us to a higher theological point. Name that human beings were made not in the image of Caesar, but in the image of who? In the image of God. In other words, Caesar is not God, and this idea that all persons are made in the image of God is what theologians call the Onagno Deo, which literally means the image of God. All persons are created in the image of God, and thus all of humanity belongs to God. Therefore, our duty to the emperor or the government is identified in this broader and more universal context of our duty to who? To God. For everything, everything belongs to God. Not just human beings created in the image of God, but everything belongs to God. Thus, we owe everything to God. And that means whatever we give to the government should be, to the best of our ability, an expression of our deeper allegiance to God. It should be an expression of our deeper allegiance to God. And in this world, we cannot avoid making political commitments. It's just not possible. 
but to live our lives out in Jesus Christ means that we also cannot claim partisan politics to be the will of God. We can make political commitments, right? We can argue about politics, right? But we can't say that the politics of any political party falls in line 110% with the will of God. Amen? Both Democrats and Republicans cannot seem to agree on anything, and they often try to use Jesus as a means of political game, like the Pharisees and the Hebeans did. Many still use this passage today in different ways as they try to entrap Jesus as well by trying to make him sound as if he's a political figure or one who submits to the ruling authorities. They use Jesus to paint a picture of one who's for giving tax rates to the rich or one who is for raising taxes on the rich as some part of social redistribution of wealth among the different social classes of America. And if we are honest, we sometimes do this too. If we are honest, the money we carry in our pockets is not much different from the Roman coin carried back in Jesus' day. They have pictures of our Caesars, right? Such as George Washington, Bob Boy, our favorite is a Benjamin Franklin, Abraham Lincoln, and each one carries the inscription, what? In God we trust. Yet at times I can't help but wonder, are those words in God we trust an empty promise? In what do we really trust? Some write in God we trust to harm the God we truly trust, our money. Like our money and our finances and our resources, some fail to see that how we spend our money shows where our loyalties lie. Oftentimes we think that moralistic ideas or roles equal Christianity. For example, some would say that it's a sin to dance. Because Exodus 31 verse 19 shows that Moses got angry at the Israelites we're dancing around the golden calf. Yet if we believe this, then we fail to see the tension that Christ is holding in our passage for today. Jesus is not giving us a concrete rule or laws to live by, but a vision of God's kingdom that is reconfiguring our loyalties. Jesus does not give us concrete rules to live by in this passage, or laws, but gives us a vision of God's kingdom that is calling us to reconfigure our loyalties and thus me and you are left with the whole job of figuring out and sorting out our loyalties as our reading of scripture, our hearing of the word, our being in community together reconfigures and transforms and changes our loyalties. As God changes our loyalties. We are called to live into the reality that God's kingdom is not separate from Caesar's kingdom, yet our true and ultimate alliance is to God. And living in means and in ways and spending our money and spending our time in ways that honor Well, as Matthew says, right? Seek the kingdom of God and all else and live righteously as he gives you everything you need. We are left to discern how to make our duty to the emperor or the government an expression of our duty to God. To discern how we spend our money and whether or not we can justify that we spend our money in ways that honor God, whom of which we owe everything. To this end, we seek God's merciful will as we strive to imitate Jesus' example, that we too right, might render all things on to God. 
I find it interesting. I find it interesting that, that Jesus takes this coin that is already considered against the laws of the poor, that's already been handed to him by a Pharisee, and thus he touches the coin and he does what? He breaks the law of the temple. I didn't say he breaks God's law. Hear me, I said he breaks the law of the temple. And he hands it and he holds it and he touches it. He says, Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Jesus is not afraid to get his hands dirty. He's not afraid to muddy the waters, right? Because Jesus did the moment he touched the coin. So we too should not be afraid to state our opinion. But we also need to be willing to hear the other person. We also need to be willing to say that my opinion isn't always the best. And maybe that's why this text falls in line with Lady Sunday. Because Lady Sunday, according to our bulletin, isn't about me, and it's not about you in specific. It says that Lady Sunday is a special Sunday defined by the General Conference to celebrate the ministry. What does it say? The ministry of what? All Christians. All Christians. Lady Sunday is one way that we express the deep conviction that all are called to participate in God's mission and live his calling through the ministry of the church. The reason I think this passage exists for today is because we, as a church, we, as the people of God, we, as both clergy and laity, are left to discern how to make our duty to the emperor or the government an expression of our duty to God in all that we do. And we can change that word emperor to anything else, how to make our family obligations an expression of our deeper commitment to God, how to make our church obligations a deeper commitment to God, how to make our work life what? A deeper Commitment to God. My prayer is all that we might seek God's will in all things. That in all things we might seek God's will as we strive to imitate Jesus' example so that we can render all things on to God. For it is to God whom we own and give all things. This is the word of God to the people of God. God of mercy, we place our trust in tangible things, things that we can see and touch and question whether or not you're really there. Forgive us, O God. When we fail to recognize that you are always nearby, patiently waiting for us to recognize your presence and your glory, help us when we lose our way. And forgive us when we forget to whom we truly belong. Lover of justice, open our eyes to see you, and open our ears to hear you, and open our hearts to love you, and open our hands that we might continue to serve you. We pray these things in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. As a response to the word of God, might you join me in confessing the creed, the apostles. I believe in God, the Father of the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and the third day he rose again from the dead. 
presented to her, said it to the right hand of God on all From that she shall come to God quick to the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life of the Lord. The instructions for tithing according to our guidelines are uh, in three stages. First, you can use the offering plate that is in the back. There are three. When you go down the center of the aisle, there are two offering plates, and when you walk out the door, right next to the cross room, there is a second offering plate. You may leave your tithe in there. You may continue to mail your tithe in, or if you look at the back of your bulletin, there is what's called a, a QR code. And you can scan that with your phone and then pay your tithe through PayPal. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pray for the tithes. Um, we'll hear benediction and then a host food. And then I think our plan states that you will be ushered out. Is that correct? Okay. So you will be ushered out individually by each. I cannot tell you how good it is to be in your presence. Again, I have truly missed each and every one of you, and it is so to see, even if you wear the face mask. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> All honor and majesty, praise and beauty are yours, Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth. Let this simple offering that we bring be a sign of the great glory that is due to your holy name, for it is to whom you will, O God, that we owe everything. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, go forth in peace and joyfully serve God. Share your lives and your washings with others in need, and go in peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.